Hey, everybody. I am Katherine Watson with Find Houston Senior Care, and I'm here today with four panelists, some experts in the field to help people stay in their own home. And I'm really excited about this. They were experts for the panel discussion at the senior conference we had uh, about a week, week and a half ago. And unfortunately, we had problems with recording. So we are doing it again. And if you didn't get to see it at the conference and you you know, wanted to get in on this, you have an opportunity now. So here we are live on Facebook. I'll also be recording this and putting it up on the senior conference for all of those who signed up. If you wanna watch it again and again, because there's tons of great information here. So what we're gonna do right now is just kind of go around the room so you can find out who our panelists are and learn a little bit about them so that you know what they're gonna be talking about. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comments below. I'll pull them up on the screen and we'll get somebody to answer your question for you. All right. So let's start up at the top. We're gonna to start with Miss Kara, Kara Delgado. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Catherine said, I'm Kara Delgado, and I'm actually the owner of the North Houston Home Instead Senior Care Office. And I have a background in social work. I've been working in the uh, arena of healthcare and senior care for about 30 years. Uh, so um, it's, been, it's been a while, and I'm excited to be here today. Great, thanks, and it's great to have you. And it looks like the platform is rotating my extra speaker in there. I don't know why. Uh, we're supposed to be able to have six on here, but uh, we'll have four at a time. So we'll bring everybody up at the right time. Stephen, let's start with you next. All right. I am uh, Stephen Crenshaw, the owner of Handle With Care, and we do senior citizen home safety. Okay, great. And you are in the North Houston area, aren't you? Yes, right. Yeah, North Houston, Cypress Tomball. Great, great. And Laurie? Hi, thank you for having me, Catherine. I'm Laurie Cantrell. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I have been working with seniors for over 30 years. Karen and I are both probably the old timers here. Um, <laughs> AMED Home Health is the agency that I work with, and we do cover the majority of the greater Houston area all the way down to Galveston Island, over through Beaumont, into Angleton, and even over to San Antonio and Austin, Corpus areas. But I do work in the north specifically. So thank you again for having me. Great. Thanks for being here. And I'm not sure what happened to Kathy. She seems to have disappeared. So maybe she was having some uh, video or audio techni technical problems. We'll hope, hopefully she'll join us in a little while, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to talk about staying in the home because that's so important. And that's why um, Everybody that's listening is probably listening to this right now. They either want to make sure that they can age in place and stay in their home till the very end of life, or they want to try to keep a parent or a grandparent or maybe a, a, their spouse or somebody that they care about. Maybe somebody that even has some health issues, maybe even somebody that has dementia. And they want to figure out ways to make it's so that they can keep them in their own home. So these services uh, are really great for helping people to age in place and stay home where they want to be. So the first question I have for all of you on, on the panel is, does your company offer some kind of a in-home assessment? How do I know if I need your services? Um, is there a charge for that assessment? How does that work? And we're going to go ahead and just, we'll stay with the same routine. We'll start with Kara. Sure. So Catherine, yes, we do offer a complimentary, no obligation in-home assessment. And we, we kind of focus on 
you know, there, there are eight needs. Um, I won't go into a great detail, but it's going to, we're going to look at their functional abilities, their gait, their ability to transfer, how's their nutrition, um, their cognitive status, the environment, and really from a standpoint of safety, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, there's no obligation. It's completely complimentary. We also have a home safety checklist so we can walk through the home and make some suggestions on how to how to make the environment more, you know, safer for that, that uh, senior. Right. And that assessment is going to kind of help you determine about how many hours a week somebody may need, um, sure. how often they should have a caregiver come in, uh, all of those types of questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, we can make some recommendations on, you know, as the experts, what we think is, is going to be the best for their family. So certainly. And I- I want to point out to Kara, like um, Lori, Lori and Kara were talking earlier, they've been around a long time in this business. They have a lot of connections, deep connections. They know the industry. Um, these ladies are invaluable uh, for you, not just to, they're not just here to sell you their services. They have a wealth of knowledge that can help you with other services that you may need, um, many of which may not cost you a penny. So you really need to get to know the people on this panel. All of them are great resources and can really help you. Stephen, do you do an assessment and tell us a little bit about um, uh, some of the kinds of services that you do and, and how do you assess a home? Oops, Stephen, we're not hearing you. Your, your microphone, there you go. There we go. Okay, great. Uh, we, do, we do assessments uh, for sure. So our assessments um, are geared more towards um, mobility and uh, egress and ingress mm-hmm. in the home. So uh, we focus more on um, the person being able to get in and out of shower safely, up and down off the toilet safely, um, in and out of the front door with regards to ramps or whatever there may need to be. But uh, Typically, and, and more often than not, it's about mobility. Mm-hmm. So it's about grab bars and uh, being able to get in and out of wet spaces more safely, I would say. And there's no charge for our assessment. Uh, while we're doing that assessment, we also address many other things as far as uh, emergency lighting, other trips and fall hazards. Um, sometimes we just have a cluttered home. You know, we have 50 years worth of collections, and as we age, they just become obstructions. And so, yes. um, you know, that's the type of thing we try to address and and um, get out of the way if need be. Mm-hmm. Great, great. And Lori, tell us a little bit more about how your company does assessments and what is involved with that. Sure. Well, what's slightly different with home health care than with Stephen and Kara's services is that we are regulated by the insurance companies mm-hmm. and we're Um, a Medicare participant. So we are definitely regulated by CMS, the governing Mm -hmm. body for Medicare Medicaid services. And and a a comprehensive assessment is certainly part of the plan. But before we can send a clinician to a home to meet with a patient, we must have the proper documentation and the proper order um, to do so. Now, I can speak with families as a community liaison at any time. We can certainly talk to families over the phone about our services. I go meet with families in facilities all the time to discuss what home health can do. But there is a very specific criteria um, to qualify. It is much more liberal during COVID um, in terms of one of the criteria is that you're homebound and the homebound criteria now includes being at high risk for exposure to COVID as a criteria. So you must need that change um, immediately after uh, the pandemic started. Um, so an assessment in terms of being free, I can certainly talk to families and tell them that home health is an appropriate choice at this point in helping keep their loved one at home. Most patients coming out of facilities after an illness or injury who are essentially homebound. Um, And that just means it requires taxing effort to leave the home. Mm -hmm. Um, But they are um, going to get referred to home health in most cases. 
I know that Kathy is trying to get back on. Um, I am quite familiar with her services as well, since we do work for the same company. She works for the hospice side. Um, if it's okay, yes, may I, I address gonna, that? I was going to ask sure. if you could do that. Absolutely. Sure. Wonderful. Where Thank you. home health is focused on helping patients recover and get better, hospice is the more appropriate choice when patients are now interested in managing their pain and no longer want to aggressively treat an illness that is most likely going to be the reason that um, they die, essentially. Mm -hmm. In terms of assessment goes, absolutely. Hospice assessments are um, quite a bit different than home health. They There's stricter criteria to qualify for hospice than there is for home health. And Kathy meets, as well as other um, healthcare professionals with our company, AMED Home Health and AMED Hospice, they meet with families all the time to discuss um, if a patient's ready. It's not always the medical criteria. A lot of it is the family being ready or the patient being ready. Right. So right. there's a the, lot of misconceptions about hospice out there. And what there it is. is. And, and all of that. And uh, so, yes, you're right. The family, they, ha they have to be ready. Um, it's a very personal decision when you make a right. choice to, to be on hospice. Um, and so it's, it's important uh, to know that. But they do do assessments. Absolutely. And, um, so you're all and those, of companies. They go into yeah. the facilities all the time. Kathy's at patients' homes in the evening quite often and on weekends to discuss the appropriateness or the readiness of the patient. And sometimes they don't meet criteria and they're more appropriate for home health. Um, we see referrals all the time where we look at it and discuss, is this patient more appropriate for hospice? And when we see that, usually they are, they're just not ready yes. um, to make that decision quite yet. Okay. All right. My next question is going to be for Kara and Lori, um, because I want to really help people to understand the differences between home care and home health care. I think it's very, very confusing for families. I know when I first uh, started looking for my mother and my mother-in-law, I didn't know the difference. And it was very confusing. My sisters had some misconceptions about what the two services did and were and the rules and who pays and all of that stuff. So um, if you would just please explain to us a little bit more and we'll start with Kara. Tell us a little bit how your service works and how it differs from home health. And then we'll listen to Lori. Okay. So home care or private duty, non-medical home care, that's often how we're referred to. Um, you know, one of the big differences really, Catherine, is we are non-skilled. So we provide caregiving and there are caregivers. None of these individuals are licensed healthcare professionals like RNs, LVNs, physical therapy, occupational therapy. So we're going to focus on activities of daily living. We can assist uh, folks with their bathing and dressing, toileting, light housekeeping. We can help with meals, uh, transportation to and from appointments, the doctor, the grocery store. So if you think about it, all of those things I just mentioned, you really don't need a license. You do not have to be an RN um, or an LVN or somebody with a license. So that that I think is, is one of the biggest differences. Also, our services are predominantly private pay. Um, you may ask this question in a little bit, but we also you know, work with long-term care insurance. Um, there's some veterans benefits through the aid and attendant program that cover the services. And there's some other funding sources that if that I can get into a little bit later. Um, whereas the home health is going to be covered predominantly by health insurance. So mm -hmm. and Medicare, Medicare and health and other types of health yes, insurance. Yes, health insurance, right. yeah, exactly. Right. So, Kara, basically what you're telling me or what I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm wrong, is you're basically cloning the adult daughter or the spouse, right? That's right. Yes. You're well, doing everything that they could do 
um, because you're not providing a medical service, but right. you're providing all the other kinds of services that an adult daughter might do or adult son or, or some other family member who's caring for somebody. That, that's correct. Um, we, we can be in the home for as little as, you know, one day for a few, four hours or so, up to 24-7. But I think the, the point I'd like to, to really focus on, Catherine, and related to your point about the adult daughter or an adult child is when we're in the home, then we can actually be the caregiver. And that then allows the family member, the adult daughter, adult son, whoever that person is, or the, the folks that live there, that allows them just to be family and let us be the caregivers. So, but you're right. I mean, we can, we can handle all of those tasks and give somebody a little bit of a break, a little bit of respite and, and um, step in and, and do the care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know who wouldn't want a clone, right? Right. right. <laughs> Do some of the things. Yeah. And and when you're trying to juggle, I know, you know, we cared for my mom and then my mother-in-law for a number of years and it, it's a lot. And luckily mm -hmm. I had my husband helping and we also hired people to help because we couldn't do it all ourselves. You just it's, can't. It's a, it's it takes a village. Difficult yeah. for any yeah. one person to take care of another person 24-7. It, it, it is. Really is. It is. And you work hand in hand with services like Lori Service, uh, like home health care, and like hospice all the time, right? Yeah, we are often in a position of talking to families about home health or hospice, um, and and sometimes even even Stephen Services. They need some adaptation to make their home safer, and we can certainly, you know, provide those resources um, and often do find ourselves yeah. in, in a position where we're helping people, you know, get resources that, that we're not able to, you know, to the needs we can't meet, we're, we're going to try to connect them to the appropriate folks that can help. Exactly. Exactly. So Miss Laurie, let's bring you up and I'm just, Kara, if you don't mind, I'm going to mute everybody as they're not talking. So you'll have to unmute yourself when it's your turn. Lori, um, tell us about home health care, because I think there's a lot of uh, confusion. What does it do? Give us some examples, some concrete sure. examples of what would I need home health care for? So home health care is not limited to any specific disease or injury or surgery. We see everything from patients having knee replacements and coming home and needing physical therapy three times a week for two weeks before they transition to outpatient, if they're able to at that point, to people who have had heart transplants or have um, artificial heart pumps keeping them alive, keeping them alive to wound care, to a new diabetic or an unmanaged diabetic who's had repeat hospitalizations and is obviously not managing things well and we can send nursing in to help teach that person. We are not meant to be long-term. There is no actual time frame that's pre-established. We work in what are 30 day certification periods within a larger 60 day certification period. And this year, 2020, Medicare started a new payment system for home health care that really emphasized the need to, quote, get in and get out. And there have been times in the history of home health where agencies have kept patients on service for years and years and years. And Medicare is really trying hard to move away from that. And Medicare does represent about 50% of the beneficiaries um, that are in the Medicare age group. Um, traditional Medicare represents about 50%. The other 50% are represented by managed care Medicare plans. And while these are required to provide the same as Medicare. It is a very different entity. We have to get approval and authorizations and it is managed care, meaning there is somebody that's providing very close oversight to how many visits you provide. So in home health, we can provide skilled nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, social work services, and a bath aid, which is a very temporary 
service. We are actually not reimbursed under traditional Medicare. That is meant to prevent further injury until the family or the patient either have a recovery. So for instance, let's go with the knee replacement or a hip fracture for a couple, three weeks. Um, that aid can assist with bathing until the patient's able to safely do it or while our occupational therapist has trained the family or caregivers such as Kara may be providing to do that service or while we get maybe state funded services in the works for a family, but it is not meant to you know, go on and on and on. Right. So there is no true limit. The, the main couple of criteria that we have to focus on is having what we call a face to face. That means that this patient's had an encounter with the prescribing physician um, it doesn't actually have to even be the prescribing physician, but with a physician or a nurse practitioner or PA in the last 90 days, or they're going to have one in the next 30 days. That's also allowed. We can start services with that anticipated as long as we have documentation that supports the need for our services. And we have a proper order and the patient is essentially homebound. They're using a walker, a wheelchair, a cane, another person, or it just requires such taxing effort to get to out of the home and into another vehicle to go somewhere. And those trips are very infrequent and only for medical reasons or to meet needs such as going to the pharmacy, the grocery store. You're actually allowed to go to church. You could go to your grandson's wedding there are mm -hmm. lots of exceptions. It's the frequency that matters. That That's a big misconception. And Very I know big. that came Absolutely. up with my family uh, when we were trying to get mom on home health care. And my sister's were really upset because they didn't want her to be on home health care because they thought she wouldn't be able to go to church. And they were really upset about that, you know, and I kept saying, yes, she can. Yes, she can. Yes, so, she can. you know, occasional things it's, it's, it, it's meant to be um, making sure that it's not somebody that's going to jump in the car and go down to the store and go shopping and if go buy a new pair of shoes. Go, and, yeah. you know, if, if you're in that position, exactly. you really don't need home health care, right? <laughs> exactly. They do exactly. say that you can go to outpatient. Now, any amount of medical, we have patients that go to mm -hmm. dialysis three days a week. They're getting hyperbaric treatment for severe wounds that they go to three times a week. There can mm -hmm. be a variety of reasons that they do go out with frequency Again, it's whether or not it's taxing effort. Mm -hmm. um, regarding if you want, did you want me to answer for hospice as well on that or not so much? We'll, no, because we'll, the we'll comparison wait a little home bit care. and see if right. she comes in. And if she doesn't, then we'll answer some of those questions. She yeah. has lost her internet connection. Oh, She's let me know. Oh, um, and no. apparently has gone down in her neighborhood. Oh, boy. <laughs> It's 2020. What can we say, guys? <laughs> it's probably all the uh, all the school age kids just yeah, logging it up. In yeah. <laughs> That's true. We didn't think about that when we scheduled three o'clock, did we? Um, yeah, yeah. I know I had to use my hotspot on my phone because my internet was slow. Okay, next question up is for Stephen. Okay, so Stephen, let's unmute you, please. Can you unmute yourself? or I'll unmute you. There we go. There we okay, go. Stephen, you're a first responder. Huh? From a first responder perspective, mm -hmm. what do seniors need to have in place in their home when an emergency event happens? Um, a couple of things. Um, one is, um, as far as the responders getting um, into the home, we have a system called a Knox box. Mm -hmm. I don't have one handy with me, but um, basically it's a lock box that goes on the garage door and it allows the fire department to gain access into the home without doing any type of damage to the structure. Um, the only people that have a key to that is the fire department. So, you know, it's not this um, perception that, oh my goodness, I have a key strapped to my wall. Everybody's going to come in and uh, have access to my home. And it's just not, it's just not that way. Um, mm -hmm. And then, so anyway, we get, we come out of the fire truck, we get the key, we come into the home, we do whatever we need to do. And then we, we're on our way. We're able to resecure the home all as well. Um, once we're in the home, there's a couple of things that we need. One is um, I have one here, actually. One is called uh, something called a file of life. And inside this file of life, there's a 
card system that folds up and tucks away real nice and neat inside the holder. The mm -hmm. back of it has a magnetic strip on it, goes on the refrigerator. And um, the information on this paper is just like a, um, it just kind of narrows down our treatment um, times. So mm -hmm. instead of doing some uh, full blown assessment, starting from scratch, we can sometimes utilize this piece of paper and pick out some points that may help us in that very moment. So if they're cool um, to touch, maybe unconscious, things like that, we can look maybe towards some diabetic stuff. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if they're sitting there and they have hypertension and then we look on here and they take blood pressure medicine and they haven't taken it yet, maybe we don't have a true medical emergency. Maybe we just have a, I didn't take my medicine yet emergency. Mm -hmm. And so, those are just some things that we, we like to use for the Knox box getting in the home and then the file of life to uh, help us assess the patient. And then always having any other type of information, a medical list, I mean, I'm sorry, a medication list, things like that. That's on here. But um, when you go to the doctor, sometimes two or three times a week, then things change. Things change and you need to update that information. Absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah, that, you know, that Knox box would have been so handy when my mother-in-law had a stroke. Mm -hmm. um, I was across town from her caring for my mom, who was completely bedbound, so I could not leave her. And my mother-in-law had a stroke. Um, and, and my husband was on the phone with her when it happened. And he called me. And of course, I called the ambulance to come. And then I thought, oh, gosh, they're going to have to break her door down. You right. know, it luckily, happens. I was able to get in touch with a neighbor. It wasn't in the middle of the night and they were able to go down there and they had an extra key right. and to her house and they got in. But, you know, had that not all worked out that way, right. it would have been a mess. And yeah, you got lucky tell that us, worked out tell that us way. about some mm -hmm. of the situations that you've oh. seen where people did not have a Knox box and so, what kind of things happened. Things. A couple of things. It can happen. It can happen either good or bad. Right. So the good way is um, we show up and the neighbor has a key or we show mm -hmm. up and there's a key under the doormat. Um, right. And then we can come in and do what we need to do and be on our way. Um, of course, the bad side of that is we show up. There's no key, no access. The, the house is secured. Uh, we can hear someone in the back of the house or inside the home hollering for help. And then we don't have any way but force our way into the home. We don't mm -hmm. kick the door in like it's a drug bust on TV. But nonetheless, <laughs> we still can damage the home a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're trying to be careful, but the issue we, what bothers us most is when we come in and the patient's on the floor and they really don't have any injuries, they just needed help up. So now we've helped them up good, but the doors broke bad. Right. And their yeah. kids live in Dallas mm -hmm. or wherever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So we call, we call the, the, their kiddos and say, Hey, you know, you, you're going to have to find somebody to come fix mom's door because it's broke. We can't sit here and babysit the front door all night. So, right. um, and then that's part of this file of life as well. It has emergency contacts on there. So we can make a phone call when the patient can. Yes. So, yes. That's uh, very important. And, and then one, one, one other way to think about it is we have, um, there's times we go into the house and we'll transport someone to the hospital. Um, and the person that lives with them can't be left alone. We may be transporting the one that the, the wife that's normally taking care of the husband. And so if that happens, we transport her. Now we have a broken door and nobody can uh, be able to stay there and help that patient. So it's a mess. It is. It is. So, so where can people get you? You sell the Knox box, right? I'm, yeah, I'm an installer and a salesman for Knox. The Knox and company. are they expensive, Stephen? So the, so the ones that go on homes are $300 flat fee, no more, no more fees forever, right? You, you buy it one time, that's it. Um, that serial number on that box is registered to that address, not per se to that person. Mm -hmm. So um, they can always move the box as long as they're staying within the same fire district. Yeah. But other yeah. than that, they're gonna, they wouldn't be able to move it with them. So. And the file it's for life. cheaper than a door. <laughs> Yeah. And, and the file for life, tell us where we would get that. So typically on a file of life, we give those out with our assessments. Mm -hmm. So if you call me and say, Hey Steve, I need to have an assessment done for my mom. Then I'm going to bring a file of life with me. And it's just kind of a little complimentary thing here. Take this. Even if you don't use our services, this is still a need. You still need this, whether you know it or not, uh, you need this. It's a very useful tool. 
but usually when I explain the need for it, it, it sells itself. I don't have to be a salesman. Um, so the idea is good, right? And so they'll agree with it, put it on the fridge or whatever the case is. Great, so. great. And I am going to bring up Miss Kathy. She made it back. Yay, Kathy. So Thank glad you. to have you back. So let's see. You dropped out right at the very beginning, didn't you? Yes, did, I did. Were you able to introduce yourself or anything? Um, no. <laughs> no. Okay. So let's go ahead and let's bring in Kathy. Uh, I'd like you to just tell us who you are, a little bit about your background, what your, what company you work for and what kind of services y'all provide. Just a, just a little bit. Okay. Okay. My name is Kathy Zaleski and I'm with AMED Community Hospice. And I've actually been in the hospice industry since 92. So I started the Texas Medical Center and um, was with a one company until I think about 2001. And then I went into the pharmaceutical industry and uh, worked in the cardiovascular arena for a while. Um, and I've been back in hospice since um, 2001. And I've been with AMED since 2016. Uh, we provide hospice care, We're one of the largest organizations in the Houston area. And uh, the unique thing is we're a family owned business. So I think Lori probably answered a few questions that were addressed to me. So thank you, Lori. And, um, I'm not sure what happened to my internet. Everything was working, but it, anyway, I apologize. Like I said, it's 2020. <laughs> we're exactly. just going to go with the flow, right? It exactly. is what it is. But I made so it back. I want to remind everybody that's watching this live on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comment section below and, and we'll be glad to answer those as well. Okay, let's see. Um, the next question I have, and we'll start with you, Kathy, since you haven't mm -hmm. got to talk mm -hmm. too much. Um, for the services that provide care, home care, home health care and hospice, how many hours a week can we expect to receive help and who will be giving that care? The way that uh, hospice works is based on the Medicare hospice benefit. So everyone basically provides their care the same way. Um, we have um, an interdisciplinary team, the nurse, the aide, social workers and chaplains. There's not a set amount of hours that they're going to be there. Um, typically AMED will, will provide um an RN case manager in the home, a minimum twice a week. Now I can't speak for every other hospice. Uh, Medicare requires that every hospice patient be seen by an RN once every two weeks. So we don't think that's enough, you know, so we minimum twice a week. However, it's not even a certain amount of time. So it just depends on what the patient needs. The nurse would go in, they would do the vital signs. We would discuss pain and symptoms. They do a lot of teaching of what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, that could be 45 minutes, an hour. I mean, it could be however long they need. So it's hard mm -hmm. to say the amount of time. Uh, so let's say they plan on twice a week, but a family patient and family need something in the middle of the night on a Saturday. You know, that's mm -hmm. another visit by another nurse. So it's real hard to, you know, put a pinpoint on how long that would be. Um, the certified nurses aid is available through AMED anywhere from three to five times a week. And that's Monday through Friday. So, um, again, and however long it takes, how long it takes, if the patient needs a shower, you know, that may be different than doing a bed baths and changing the linens on the bed. So it really can't be number of hours. Social worker and chaplain will make a visit, you know, and again, that's just as long as it needs to be. Right. But that, answer, that's the but, thing that I think people don't understand about hospice. And that's what I love about hospice is mm -hmm. it's a whole team. You don't just get one person coming there. It's a whole team. And I always say another set of eyes on Absolutely. the person that you love. So uh, if you can't be there 24 seven and who can, um, you've got somebody else popping in here and there. Mm -hmm. You've got the chaplain coming in. You've got the social worker coming in. You've got, you know, a caregiver maybe coming in, a nurse, all of these different people. But tell me what's going on right now because we're in COVID and the pandemic. How has that changed? And are they still able to go in and provide the care? Is How has that changed, Kathy? In the home, it's pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, now, we do have situations where the patient's COVID positive, And it, again, it depends on the needs of the patient. We are able to even do visits virtually in some instances. 
because we're not intended to replace the patient and the family's caregiver, the primary caregivers anyway. Right. So, uh, you know, and some, some patients and families want us to come in that minimum once every two weeks and others want us to move in. So it's just that happy medium, you know, and it's, uh, but, but again, there's a lot of situations where if a patient's COVID positive, we are able to, to provide that care virtually, um, at least, at least the part of it to where we would do the assessment and the pain and the symptom management. Now that's in the home. Now with, um, in a facility for a while, no one was allowed in the facilities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, not even the nurse. And now I believe most of the facilities are allowing at least a nurse and some, the nurses aid. So that's out of our control, you know, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it's, it's the same yeah. as it normally would be. Great, great. All right. Um, Lori, let's go with you next. So can you tell us um, how many about how many hours a week could we expect and how does that work? Well, just like with hospice, I think there is a little bit of a misconception sometimes about home health too. We don't our our services are not provided in terms of hours. That does fall more under what Kira's company does. So depending on what the patient needs and the frequency with which it's number one ordered and number two can be provided and the patient can tolerate, um, that determines the frequency of the visits. The length of the visit is required to be a minimum of 35 minutes. Um, it will not last more than 55 for therapy. Um, some nursing visits take a lot longer if you have a patient with a really serious wound or multiple serious wounds. Um, the nurse may be in the house an hour and a half up to two hours. Sometimes I have families ask me, well, can we have the nurse there from eight to nine and the therapist there from nine to 10 and then the aide there from 10 to 11? It doesn't work like that either. Um, we do everything we can to accommodate requests of the patients if they're not morning people or they have dialysis in the morning. Of course, we're going to come in the afternoon. But in terms of the exact time, home health is always provided in a two hour window um, because we can't you know, account for weather, traffic and when we get to a home and what's going on. So, again, um, to summarize, it's very dependent on the individual patient, a typical scenario would be a patient with a new hip fracture who maybe had had a stroke and fell or had some other medical condition that created the need or created the fall um, or the cause of the fall. The nurse may be going out once a week. Um, maybe they go twice the first week and then down to once a week, maybe twice the first two weeks then down to once a week. And then therapy is generally going to be twice mm -hmm. a week. Um, if they're getting both OT and PT, it's going to be twice a week for each. Um, generally, only a brand new orthopedic surgery case is going to have um, therapy in the house three times a week. Mm -hmm. um, just one discipline. That's just the way we're there to really bridge going to home. We're not meant to be um, all the therapy. We're really there to set the patient up for success, prevent future injuries, and teach them a program that they maintain. And that's a, a very important point that they are doing what we are working with them on in between our visits. Okay, great. Thank you. Like homework. Yes. <laughs> so, so both hospice and home health care tag team perfectly with Ms. Delgado's company uh, that provides home care. And so, Kara, tell us a little bit about how your services work. Um, obviously, yours work differently. Um, people can choose how many hours they want. So tell us a little bit more about that. Whoops, we need to unmute you. Hold on a minute, Kara. There we go. Whoops. I think we did it at the same time. There we go. Okay. You okay, can, can hear you hear me? me? Good, good. So yeah, Catherine, we have clients that we are seeing 24-7. Mm -hmm. um, some that are really once a month and anywhere in between. It, it really just depends on what folks need, want, and certainly the, the cost of what they can afford. Um, you know, Lori mentioned, you know, the, the care plan and 
one of the things I feel like we can help with in supporting the home health or supporting the hospice and reinforcing their the care plan. So if, a, if an individual does have physical therapy, chances are if the therapist is not in the home one day or, you know, if they're only there two to three days a week, that that individual may not be doing their home exercise program. We can reinforce that. We can I can have the caregiver sit with the client and do the exercises and make sure that those those exercises are getting done on the days that the home health folks are not there. Um, the industry standard is really a mm-hmm. four hour visit or greater. So that I think that really is for the caregiver's sake. It's it's a, a pretty big request to ask somebody to go to work for less than four hours at a time. And there there are companies that will do it. We will do it. Uh, most are going to charge more because we we really have to incentivize the caregiver to, to go somewhere or to go to work for two or three hours. So they generally going to be paid more. So um, again, anywhere from one day a week, one day a month, four hour mm-hmm. shift to 24 seven. Okay. All right. And tell us a little bit more. I know you mentioned briefly about how how people pay for your services. So there's a variety of ways that people can pay for your services. Let's delve into that a little bit. Sure, sure. Well, obviously, or maybe not so obvious to, to some of your audience, uh, private pay, it's predominantly private pay. We do have uh, a number of clients that have long-term care insurance. Want to make sure I mention that um, the the veterans uh, aid and attendant program does cover home care. There are also some underutilized serv- uh, resources out there. One is Hilarity for Charity, and that is a foundation that was started by, of all people, Seth Rogen. Um, there are respite grant funds available to folks with some type of dementia or, or Alzheimer's, but any, any diagnosis of dementia, a person can apply for those respite mm-hmm. uh, grants. The Houston Area Parkinson Society does have some funds available for uh, grant respite care, have to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And let's see, uh, the Area Agency on Aging usually has some funds early in the year, but they typically run out pretty quickly. Um, I think that's about it. But um, definitely the Hilarity for Charity is is a resource that is underutilized. We have a client right now, 25 hours a week that we're providing care for and the family, the client is not paying a dime. Wow. So, wow. Wow. That is, sure that is that. wonderful. That is wonderful. Yeah. Hilarity for Charity that has just come on my radar recently. Is it fairly new, Carol, or is that, has that been around for a while? I, well, gosh, a few years at least. Uh-huh. Um, so Seth, Seth Rogen's mother-in-law had early onset dementia, and he saw personally the devastation that 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 had on his family and his wife and um, he wanted to do something. So if you, you can go to YouTube and you can Google and, or, and see him testifying in front of Congress for more funds Mm -hmm. in terms for research of, of Alzheimer's, but he then started the foundation and basically he puts on these comedy shows and they're, they just, they're fundraisers. Um, Not my cup of tea when it comes to, his humor by any means, but you know, he's doing a good thing. It's a good cause. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's great. That's great. So it's, it's nice to know that there's resources out there and it's nice to know that there's people out there like yourself that really have a, a finger on the pulse and know about these resources and where to go to get them. I mean, if somebody uh, wanted to know about veterans benefits, I'm sure you could point them in the right direction. Sure. You have somebody that you probably work with that could help them with that right Uh, same way with long-term care if they have a long-term care policy you can help figure out what will it pay right right yeah we we certainly can help them you know research the what what are the benefits for a long-term care policy um lori mentioned the medicare advantage plans or those managed medicare plans so we are seeing in 2020 some medicare advantage plans are paying for private duty home care. Um, there are, we're, we believe we're going to see more of that in 2021. Um, it's, it's still fairly new. It's, and we're, we're all kind of learning about that, but I, I think that the, 
the point really is that the government, Medicare, and the folks who run that are seeing that the most people want to stay at home um, if that is possible in terms of you know their safety. It's also the most effective or, or cost effective way of of caring for folks is in their own home. So we're going to see more and more of the those Medicare Advantage plans covering private duty home care. Great, great. Okay, I want to go back to Stephen now. So Stephen, unmute yourself. You got it. Okay. All right. So Stephen, um, I know that you do a lot. You we talked about we've all talked about falls and and that's one of the things that a lot of times uh, leads to the demise of a senior. Um, it's one of the things that a lot causes a lot of people to end up in nursing homes and things like that. So we all want to try to avoid these falls that we break a hip or, you know, have another major, maybe we uh, hit our head and have um, a major trauma from that. Uh, your company really focuses in on that and the things that you do. Let's talk about the bathroom. Okay, because that's a source for falls a lot of times for people. So what kinds mm -hmm. of things would you do in someone's bathroom to help make it safer and more senior friendly? Well, one of the first things we want to do is um, put grab bars in, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because you, you need to have something in your hands, a grab bar in your hands when you're transitioning from uneven level surfaces of the floor. Um, or just in a wet space. So if you're having to step over into a bathtub or transition from the bathroom floor to the shower floor, whether it be a swinging door or whatever the case is, then having a grab bar in your hand is very, very important. We like to have what we call three points of contact at all times. We want either both hands on the bar and, and um, at, at once while you shuffle your feet or at least one hand on the bar while you take a, both hands on the bar while you take a step or at least one hand on the bar during a transition. Mm -hmm. We never want to just kind of be freestanding out there with our hands up while we're trying to make steps. Now, having said that, there's many things we can do. But I find that a lot of your small showers, um, well, that swinging door, it prevents you from being able to get your walker or your wheelchair up close to the door, to the shower. You're kind of had, you're kind of having to be stood off. However, however wide that door is, it swings out into your opening and you can't um, be too close. Right. So mm -hmm. by the time you kind of park your walker, get the door open. No, now you can't reach the bar. It's too far away. So we like to just take the doors off and put a shower curtain. It may just be a, a kind of a stop gap. Right. So we do that. Let some rehab happen and just kind of back up and see where we are in two or three months. And if we're better, then we come and put everything right back to where it was. If we're not better, maybe we consider doing something different. But in the meantime, we make it as safe as possible by using grab bars. Mm -hmm. And you can cut out the tubs too, can't you? Yeah, we do. We have a, uh, a system that we install called a clean cut. And I, in fact, I did one of those this morning. Um, so what we actually do is we cut a section of the bathtub out and you can put a transfer chair that straddles that cut or you can put a grab bar and it just um, it enables you to only have a about a four inch rise of getting in over into the tub instead of a 13 or 14 inch rise. Right. So you right. don't have to step up as far. You can either sit down and just kind of slide sideways right through the gap that we cut, mm -hmm. or you can uh, just step over that small low threshold. Right. It's really, it's a really, really cost effective way to getting an old school bathtub um, to be, to be able to get in and out of it safely without having to do a full blown tub removal, shower floor, tile job, you know, that, that oh. gets expensive. So, um, and a lot of your older homes, they have a tub and they may have just a tub and that right. shower and the tub and they have a shower curtain. That's and right. my mother-in-law had that situation and mm -hmm. it scared me to death because she had rheumatoid arthritis. She was not very agile and stepping over that. It was always, you know, we worried about that. So that's the norm. Uh, 
yeah, that in, especially in the older homes, mm -hmm. it, that is the norm. And so it's good to know that there's a solution that can be done that's not extremely expensive. Not everybody can afford to just gut out their bathroom and remodel it. Right. Don't we all wish, but right. you know, not everybody can do that. And yeah, especially right. a lot of our seniors who are on a fixed income and they're worried about the money anyway. So right. great. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, Kathy, I want to go back down to you uh, because we haven't talked too much about hospice. And it's a word that a lot of times invokes certain feelings. Uh, people tend mm -hmm. to think that hospice is for the very last minute. And you don't call the hospice team in because that's basically kind of the death squad or something. And you don't bring them in until the very last minute. And that's <laughs> not really true, is it, Kathy? No, it's not, Catherine. Actually, that's one of the biggest misconceptions that I run into because, like you said, people hear, wait, mama's not going anywhere today. I'm like, no, she's not. You know, I mean, that just because hospice has been called, it doesn't mean that anything's happening this week or this month even, you know, or down even further. Uh, the, the big thing that makes the difference is, is, is the patient going to be having any more aggressive treatment? So, I met a gentleman yesterday who cannot have any more aggressive treatment, but he walked in, met me at the door and, you know, I mean, but that doesn't mean, I mean, he has a terminal diagnosis and he has cancer. So just, just looking at him and what people tend to think or based on what they see, you know, means nothing. So uh, it's better to get connected right off the bat. So um, I mentioned I've been in hospice since 92 and back then, most of our referrals came from the hospitals and I would call on doctor's offices and they would say, oh, well, yeah, I love hospice, but I mean, patients, my patients are referred out of the hospital. Well, I would explain, yes, of course they are. We have a lot of referrals from the hospital. However, think about patients that you have now that aren't in the hospital. They have a terminal diagnosis. However, they're not in a crisis. So it's better for us to get connected now when we know that they meet criteria versus when they're in a crisis, they're at the hospital, they just found out they have a terminal illness, they're coming home and they have days to live. If we could alleviate that crisis and trip to the hospital for the most part, because yeah. we're, we're already there, they're in the home and they're comfortable. So when they need something, instead of calling 911, they call us. So, I mean, the, the patients have gotten to a point where we know there's nothing else that we can do to cure their illness. That's the most important part. So it is not just for the end. Although, I mean, people have this um, misconception that hospice is only a little white house on the hill and they go up to the house on the hill and then they keep going up, you know, hopefully. <laughs> so, and, um, and again, that doesn't always happen. But um, yes, I mean, there are inpatient hospices where, you know, you have right at the end days of care. However, the majority of our patients and actually in the North office, we um, actually have a pretty long length of stay. So that just tells me that we're doing a really good job of educating the community to refer appropriately, not referring at the very end. Right. My mother, I, I think I mentioned this to you before. My mother was mm -hmm. on hospice for almost two years. My mother-in-law for seven months we could not have done it without the hospice team. Yeah. We just couldn't. There, there are times though, like you, like your mom, if she was on for two years, then she must have been continually declining because I always explain when I meet with patients and families, although people ask me all the time, how long can mm -hmm. I have this service? Mm -hmm. And the simple answer is as long as you need it. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there are different benefit periods. The first benefit period is 90 days, 90 days, and then unlimited periods of 60 days. So there's a check Point. So at 90 days, we would have a, a nurse practitioner that's not connected with us necessarily. It's a new set of eyes and ears. They're going to come in and they're going to say, how's the patient doing today compared to when they were admitted? And we do expect our patients to decline some quicker than others, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they level off and perk up and they end up coming off of hospice because they just don't meet criteria anymore. And then they could come back later when they do need it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mama, mama was sent home with a 30 day diagnosis. They said mm -hmm. she had about 30 days. So she, was tough. She, kept, she kept living. She was 93 yeah. when she mm -hmm. passed away. And uh, we were actually called to her bedside numerous times. And uh, as soon as everybody would get there, or as soon as one of us would get there, she'd pop up and say, I'd like some ice cream, you know, or something oh. like that. I mean, she would just, 
it, it was just she would go up and she would go down and she would it was just a sing song swing I, I don't know why but that's the way it works so she stayed on yeah like i said almost two years it was quite wow. a good time but we couldn't have done it without the hospice team and without home care in place mm -hmm. and before we had hospice we had home care and home okay. health care okay. and we had somebody that came into the home and put in the grab bars and so we've used all of these services yeah and um, you you know you there's not one that i would say you don't need um, you need every one of these services. Yes, ma'am, Lord. Catherine, I want to point something out um, on Kathy's behalf here because it, it's, it falls kind of in between. The diagnosis that the patients are being treated for on hospice um, are separated from any other diagnosis that the patient has. And this played a part in my mother being on hospice. But you are allowed to still see a physician that's treating. And I'll let Kathy maybe comment on that but you can see a physician that may be treating you for a different health problem and still continue some treatment um, for an unrelated to the diagnosis that puts you on hospice i think for some people that might be important to know that mm -hmm. um kathy if you wanted to maybe elaborate yeah. on that yeah. thank you um say for example we have a patient with breast cancer and she, that's her terminal diagnosis. We know that that's what's going to ultimately take her life. And she has a prognosis of six months or less if the disease process takes it normal, its normal course. She also has a, a small heart condition that she's seen her cardiologist for. Uh, they're titrating medication or whatever, you know, that's, but that has nothing to do with the terminal diagnosis of what we are admitting her for. So yes, she can still continue to go see that cardiologist. And we've even had patients that um, have continued their renal dialysis, but their diagnosis is not in-stage renal disease. They may have a cancer diagnosis or they may have a heart failure diagnosis, COPD or something. So they can continue that dialysis. And that people are like, oh, I had no idea. But I mean, truly, it's not related. So that can actually continue. Um, we even have patients that ask, can I still see my PCP or can that doctor still be involved? And actually, we encourage the PCP to remain the attending if they can, because uh, that PCP knows that patient and family better than anybody else. And that family is going to be a lot more comfortable making that transition to hospice if that long relationship is still in place. Yeah. So um, that is something that I know a lot of companies don't offer, but really it makes a lot of sense. And we've even connected with some of our good medical directors doing exactly that because mm -hmm. they realize hey, I really like the way this company takes care of their patients and, you know, we'd like to work together. So it, it, it turns out being good for everyone. Good, good. Guys, we are running low on time. So I want to ask one last question. Um, so many people these days are suffering from different types of dementia, including Alzheimer's. How can we help them to stay in the home and can we help them stay in the home until the very end of life? And how does your service help with that? So we're going to start up at the top with uh, Ms. Cara Delgado. And if you'll just give us a little bit of information about that. Sure. So, Catherine, you know, I would say probably over 50 percent of the folks that we are caring for in, in their homes have some form of dementia, Alzheimer's being the most common type of dementia. Um, we have our own uh, specialized Alzheimer's training. Um, it was developed by experts in the field, a, a gentleman by the name of David Truxell. He wrote the best friend's approach to Alzheimer's care. So, you know, our goal is to try to get as many of our caregivers trained in that Alzheimer's training as possible. But the main focus is safety and um, just really making sure that that those clients are, are if they're wondering, if they're uh, confused and forgetful, you know, we want to make sure they're they're safe. If they they forget to leave the stove on, if they forget to turn the water off, things like that. Um, and I think also just give the family a break because it can, as I mentioned earlier, it's very challenging to take care of another person 24 seven, especially when that person has Alzheimer's and dementia, because there's just a whole range of behaviors that come from 
that disease and that particular diagnosis that can be very, very challenging to manage for family yes, members. It can. Yes, it can. It's very emotional for family members. Absolutely. Yeah. Stephen, I know that Alzheimer's dementia is not your uh, expertise in here, but uh, I'm thinking that some of the things that you do might help someone with those conditions as well. What are your thoughts? Well, uh, for us, it really, um, well, I, I don't really know, really, I'll, to be honest with you. I'm not sure um, other and, than just a mobility issue. And that is issue, an issue a lot of times um, with people with and, dementia. And they, you know, have what we call the dementia shuffle sometimes. They have um, forgetfulness, they, right. things yeah. like that. Um, so even if they were alert when a EMT came in, they might not be able to tell the EMT what medications they're on. But that file of life could help. Right. So yeah, absolutely. that's kind of the file of life. It helps with that, right? Um, but as far as mm -hmm. as far as the shuffle, right? I mean, there's. But to us, it's just a, another a mm -hmm. patient with a balance issue, right? They still need the grab bars. It doesn't change one way or the other, uh, other than. The one aspect I can say it, it may change would be making sure that we have, we try to set every bathroom up mm -hmm. the same um, so that we have some sort of um, memorization. If for what it's worth, you're able to try to remember that the grab bar is on this side every time. Mm -hmm. And if we don't want to go from one bathroom to the next and things change up and cause confusion. So if we can ever, if Handle With Care can add anything specifically about Alzheimer's or dementia, I guess that might be it ensuring that we have um, things kind of universal around the house, same location, same height. So if something goes wrong and they do have a little, they have the ability to remember in that moment, they'll, the, what they remember will be there for them. So. Great. All right. Thank you. Lori. Well, with home health care, part of what, a large part of what we're trying to accomplish is teaching. And the obvious there is that somebody with Alzheimer's wouldn't be teachable, but that's not completely correct. Number one, um, we can also teach family or friends or caregivers. So we definitely have a role with these patients. Um, a very wonderful story comes to mind um, that I can share. Uh, that Kathy and I share, and that is um, a healthcare professional that I work with referred her father-in-law to us recently, and to hospice actually. Mm -hmm. And the hospice got in there, and through having more eyes on the patient, like we talked about, mm -hmm. um, made a recommendation on a medication that was so significant to his cognition mm -hmm. that my friend or my colleague now jokingly says we maybe ought to get them off hospice and put them on home health. It makes <laughs> such a difference. And yeah. so sometimes when we get in the home, we can determine things like medications aren't being taken properly and we can give tools and teach tools. I have another scenario recently where we got the daughter to buy this alarm based medication box and the patient's cognition has gone from here to here literally in two weeks she is now taking all of her medication on a daily basis it's been phenomenal we also made her a, a pill poster with all of her medications <laughs> taped on there and the name of them so there's things that we can do now obviously later with the progression of the disease it becomes more difficult and we could not keep these patients at home without help of agencies like CARA. And then there's definitely a point where hospice becomes a great choice yeah. to consider with this population. So with that, I will turn that over to Kathy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the so the pill minder is a great little tool. And we got one Absolutely. of those from my mother-in-law because she was having the beginning stages of dementia. But she was clever too. And so she really didn't like taking her medication. So she learned that when it beeped, she just turned it over and dumped the pills out and didn't take them. So luckily we had a team coming in, a home care team coming in. Like that would catch company, that. And they would come in and see the pills yeah. on the counter. Yeah. And so they would, oh, Miss Pat, you must need yeah. some juice to take your pills. And they'd get her some juice and she'd take the pills. But it was, I, it was you know, it makes me want party. 
<laughs> it makes me want to point out that I think it's really important for families when they're going to visit mom and dad and they think mom and dad might be okay. They know something's going on, but patients can fake it for about mm -hmm. 45 minutes. And I think that's really important. I remember having a case where I went to see her and I, I, the nurses were all complaining. The therapy was all complaining that there was something very wrong. They thought she had Alzheimer's. I literally at 42 minutes was going to leave my assessment that there was nothing wrong with that lady and um, that patient. And she asked me if I had a shovel and I, if I could help her dig her dead dog up out of the kitchen floor. Oh. And I was like, okay, I'm going to stay a little bit longer. <laughs> and, um, I had to have that discussion with adult protective services about not just coming in and leaving too quickly and not seeing that. So I think it's real important that family members stay long enough to really capture to where that patient's at. And, and again, I think it's important to have professionals coming in the house because mm -hmm. They're looking at things with a different, clear set of eyes. I know myself uh, with my own mom and my husband with his mom, it's emotional. And you don't want to see certain things. And so and you, you, are, that's, you are not the professional, on. right? You, you have are some blinders on yeah. because uh, it's your parent and you want to believe that everything's okay. And that you maybe just imagine that there was a problem yesterday, especially with dementia, because it doesn't follow a straight line. It goes up and one day they're perfect and they're just spot mm -hmm. on normal. And then the next day they're out in left field somewhere and you're wondering what's going on. So, um, you know, I think that's why I, I really think it's important. Uh, if you suspect anything, you're probably right and get some professionals in there. Even, even if you just hire Kara's company to come in one day a week and start noticing because they'll see things that you didn't see. I guarantee you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Kathy, let's go to you now. Mm -hmm. So how how do you how does hospice help somebody who has dementia? Actually, for a patient to be appropriate for hospice um, who has dementia, either from dementia from a stroke or Alzheimer's, um, you know, we we care for that patient like we would care for others in a in a sense. I mean, but people don't realize really what it takes for them to meet criteria. So there's a staging, there's a staging system and for the patient to meet criteria, they would be a, a 7C, I believe. And, and typically uh, an, a dementia patient, an Alzheimer's patient cannot ambulate on their own. They can't dress, they are incontinent. And it's, uh, you know, a, sometimes patients with um, Alzheimer's or with stroke, I mean, in dementia, they, they come onto service too soon. And it's something that, you know, when we want to help them as quickly as we can, however, it happens where maybe they're not declining like we thought they were and they have to come off service and that's very disruptive, you know. So there's a very specific staging system that we look at. And, and again, they cannot um, speak more than six intelligible words, at you know, typically in a given time. So, um, but what we do is we're going to um, really support the, the family and the caregivers with that, with the loved one in that situation. We will, um, typically a patient in that situation is going to get a bed bath, you know, so that'll be the, the nurses, the nurse's aid will be, you know, three to five times a day and then three to five times a week. And then the RN is going to do a lot of teaching with that family, you know, what to expect. And, um, and sometimes it's hard to tell if they're in pain, you know, so there's, there's different ways that we can tell that they don't really know, know, you know, mama can't talk. So how do we know if she's in pain? Right. Well, there's still a lot of ways to be able to take her. I mean, tell her blood pressure and just, you know, a lot, a lot of different ways. So, um, but our goal is for them to be able to stay at home uh, until the end. And there's another level of care called crisis care. It's paid for by Medicare. Again, one of the levels of care with the Medicare hospice benefit. And if we, um, if there's, if that patient's having pain or symptoms that we cannot manage with those um, intermittent visits, that would be like uncontrollable pain, nausea and vomiting, shortness of breath. They would qualify for that other level of care. And that's where we bring a nurse to the bedside. So it's anywhere from eight to 12, eight to 24 hours a day, depending on what's going on. And it's not intended to last very long because whatever has that patient in a crisis, we want to get them comfortable and it goes back to the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's with all patients across the board, not just dementia. Yeah. 
I know pain was a, a big issue with my mother-in-law and mm -hmm. she couldn't communicate with us. And the hospice team was fabulous in helping identify what was going on and mm -hmm. uh, getting her the proper medication. So she was comfortable. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being here today. Um, again, we've been doing how to stay living in your own home with these experts. And I'm going to go around the room and we're going to put up a phone number. So if you want to reach out to any of these people, um, uh, any of these experts, you can do that. So Kara, just uh, say who you are so that they remember. This is Kara. Uh, yeah, Kara Delgado with Home Instead Senior Care. Okay. And her phone number is at the bottom of the screen. Um, and then we'll go to Stephen. Hello, this is Stephen, Handle with Care, Senior Home Safety. And that's my number there, 281-932-1551. Okay, and Kathy? Kathy Zaleski with AMED Community Hospice. And my cell phone, 713-898-8776. Great, thank you. And Lori? Laurie Cantrell with AMED Home Health. And I'm going to stick this in because I forgot to say this benefit is often covered 100% by your insurance and Medicare. And my office number is 713-941-2115. Okay, great. So everybody, thank you for being here. And uh, we will make sure that this also goes up at the seniorconference.com so that anybody that wanted to see that replay that didn't get to watch it on Facebook can watch it there. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.